Maryland Life Sciences would like to recognize today's presenting sponsors, Avantour. Avantour is a trusted global partner to customers and suppliers in the life sciences and advanced technologies and applied materials industries. Our premier delivery channel, VWR, provides access to product and service solutions. Our portfolio is used in virtually every stage of science in the industries we serve. The Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. The Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, Pharma, represents the country's leading innovative biopharmaceutical research companies, which are devoted to discovering and developing medicines that enable patients to live longer, healthier, and more productive lives. Since 2000, Pharma member companies have invested more than $1 trillion in the search for new treatments and cures including $91.1 billion in 2020 alone. The Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation of Maryland. Maryland's Montgomery County is a thriving life sciences hub with global reach and where scientific breakthroughs happen every day. Home to the NIH and the FDA, launch your business in the immunology capital next to the nation's capital. Connect at thinkmoco.com. The Maryland Department of Commerce. Welcome to Maryland, where day by day, dreamers are becoming doers, makers, and pioneers of the future. And while the state's code breakers, vaccine makers, and next-gen manufacturers are pioneering our future, they're doing it in a place that's best for their future. Make a move to Maryland to take advantage of our natural business assets, boundless resources, and amazing quality of life. We'd like to thank these and all of our sponsors for their continued support of the Maryland Life Sciences Bioinnovation Conference. Maryland Life Sciences would like to recognize today's industry sector sponsors. Representing biomanufacturing, Kite. Kite, a Gilead company, is a global biopharmaceutical company headquartered in Santa Monica, California. Kite has manufacturing operations in North America and Europe, including a new state-of-the-art cell therapy commercial manufacturing facility in Frederick, Maryland. Kite's singular focus is cell therapy to treat and potentially cure cancer. As the cell therapy leader, Kite has more approved CAR-T indications to help more patients than any other company. Representing cell and gene therapy, Maxite. As a pioneer in cell engineering technology, we're passionate about enabling the discovery, development, and manufacturing of the next generation of medicines, harnessing the power of living cells to transform lives. For over 20 years, Maxite's core flow electroporation technology has aided researchers in delivering virtually any molecule to any cell, safely engineering the cells needed to develop new therapies. Our electroporation technology has been used in numerous clinical trials by leading pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies across a diversity of indications, including cancer, central nervous system disorders, and rare genetic diseases. As we grow, we continue to evolve, working with our partners to produce best-in-class solutions that accelerate the development of novel therapies to improve patient outcomes. Representing vaccines and immunotherapy, Novavax. At Novavax, we never rest in our quest to protect the health of people everywhere. This mission guides all we do. We're relentlessly committed to promoting improved health globally through the discovery, development, and commercialization of innovative vaccines to prevent serious infectious diseases. As a biotechnology company based in Gaithersburg, Maryland, we are proud to support the 2022 Maryland Life Sciences Bioinnovation Conference. We'd like to thank all of our industry sector sponsors for their continued support of the Maryland Life Sciences Bioinnovation Conference.
Our next panel will highlight how Maryland-based companies are expanding the boundaries of cell and gene therapies. Please welcome your moderator, Leslie Eschinger, Director of Marketing Development, Maxite. My name is Leslie Eschinger and I'm the Director of Marketing for Maxite. I'm going to be leading and moderating today's session, which is expanding the boundaries of cell and gene therapy. Uh, since 2016, there have been 24 FDA-approved therapies to treat a diversity of clinical indic indications and tissue targets, including cancer, neuromuscular disease, neurogenerative disease, and retinal dystrophy. Today's informative session features frontier speakers who are pushing the boundaries to create new generations of therapies that will enhance patient outcomes through cell engineering, RNA engineering, and AAV gene therapy. I'd like to introduce, or to actually have them introduce themselves today, three panelists. Chuck Suman, our Chief Scientific Officer at Maxite, Dr. Milos Mil I'm going to butcher this, I'm so sorry. It's fine. Milkovic, the Chief Medical Officer from Cartesian, and Craig Malzen, the Senior Vice President of Technical Operations from Agenex Bio. Thank you. Should I go? Yes, sorry. <laughs> so um, I'm actually going to speak from here. Uh, Jenk Suman, I'm a T cell immunologist by training, and uh, I'm going to drive my slides through here. So I'll just got, take you guys through. Uh, what we do at Maxite, and we basically upload the software into the cells. If you think of the cells as little machines that go into the patients and, and do their jobs, we work on uploading that software. And this is just a legal disclaimer. So this is Maxite's 23-year history, all condensed into one slide. Uh, we're founded here in Maryland. Uh, we built our technology, uh, moved into flow electroporation. That's basically applying electricity to bring molecules into cells. We listed on the London Stock Exchange, and just last year we listed on NASDAQ, so we're a public company. And uh, just two weeks ago, we were happy to launch our new headquarters in um, Montgomery County in Rockland, Maryland. Here's our machines, they look very beautiful, but uh, it's what they do that really matters, and uh, cells are very happy with them because they're alive. We have high efficiencies, high viability, and um, we can get almost any molecule into any cell. And one thing we really pride ourselves on is scale. So if you notice the instrument at the very left is uh, for research use only, so you can start your process, optimize that, and move it seamlessly all the way up to 200 billion cells. That's the large one on the right we're really proud of. So uh, 200 billion cells. So just to give you a sense of scale, the human body has about 30 to 40 trillion cells. So it's, a, it's a lot of cells, so you can do a lot of things with these. Um, we partner with some of the leading names in the industry. I won't go through each one, but you'll notice one of the sponsors from today, Kite, is up there. So a lot of very uh, prominent cell therapy companies are in there, and I can announce two that we signed this year into my biosciences and LG Chem. And uh, we're very proud to be part of the uh, Montgomery County, uh, second highest concentration of STEM jobs, 1.5 million wet lab space under construction, almost $6 billion in investment last year. Uh, 40,000 plus colleagues here working on this. I'm part of the plus. I moved here from New York City after 16 years, so proud to be part of this ecosystem. And we're the fourth largest biotech hub in the whole country, which is really impressive. And uh, have access to working with our colleagues uh, at the uh, government agencies. So happy to share with you uh, when Brad made the comment that, you know, I'll have to go after Mike again. So this is actually at our event two weeks ago when we had the ribbon cutting ceremony. And uh, we have uh, over 67,000 total uh, feet of space, and we're very happy to we get all our employees, 100 plus employees, under one roof, engineering, R&D, our field application scientists, our marketing, so now we can really build our culture of innovation and collaboration within the teams. Uh, it's really, we're focused on the patient journey. This is really important as we can address more and more diseases. So we're very committed to patients. Um, I've known Emily for very many years. She's on the right. She's the first pediatric CAR-T patient, and she's actually set up her own foundation now. So she's a spokesperson helping other patients, a very committed, driven individual going off to college now. 
And um, now we're forming partnerships with other patient organizations addressing um, diseases that have a lot of impact to the social fabric of this country, such as sickle cell disease. And we're in, engaged in a cross-functional initiative to better understand the patient journey and understand the social, racial, economic, uh, and bioethical issues that patients have to go through. Um, so that's, uh, just wanted to point that out. So just a few more slides on my part um, to make a point that um, the gene and cell therapy industry, sometimes the cell therapy is called you know, ex vivo gene therapy, but it's, um, there's over 2,000 clinical trials that are ongoing, uh, and over 1,000 are genetically modified cell therapies that are in development. Many of these are using our instruments. And now we have, uh, in preclinical, 350-plus uh, um, clinical trials. So last year alone, the global financing was 23 billion plus, 16% increase year over year. And in 2022, the focus is on um, handling the complexity. So extending this to different cell types that were considered non-standard just a couple of years ago. Uh, different cargo, um, you know, CRISPR has undergone CRISPR 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, many generations. And uh, new genes, you can see just uh, a few of these. So if, if your favorite gene is not on here, just come and let me know, we can talk about it. <laughs> Uh, so we can express any molecule with our platform, I mean, really any molecule, including some on the right that you might, uh, you might say, hey, you know, this is, these are viruses, you know, I, think, I thought this was a non-viral company. So you can actually use our technology to make viruses that you can use for gene therapy, for example. And um, almost any kind of cargo. Uh, some of these molecules are used in, you know, what I'm kind of just referring to as cellular engineering or cell programming. You need to target the, uh, uh, the DNA modifications. So, you need the right molecules to do that targeting, and even you know, cell lysates and bigger uh, molecular uh, organizations. So just a little bit on the clinical trials. So this is just a, a map, one way of looking at the uh, development pathway. So if you just imagine on the outer circle is the phase one clinical trials, and you're trying to move towards bullseye, right? In the middle of the bullseye is commercial, when you get commercial approval. And these are some of our um, partners. You can see that the pink ones are allogeneic. These are donor-derived cell therapies. The green ones are autologous, you know, bespoke. Uh, the cells from one patient go back to the same patient. And you can see a, a healthy representation of different modalities, different cell types. So we really cover all bases. And you notice there's no dot in the center yet, right? So there hasn't been a commercial approval with our technology that's coming up soon. So we're very excited to consider that. I'll just put that out there. So we're expecting that in the next year or the year after, a first site enabled therapy for, uh, that gets commercially approved. Um, I think with that, I'll, I'll finish. I'm going to have to take questions at the end. So, yeah, thank you. Um, clicker? Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Milos Milkovic. I'm the chief medical officer uh, of Cartesian Therapeutics, which is a small, tiny in comparison privately on biotech in Gatesburg, Maryland. Uh, and I will talk to you uh, about expanding cellular therapy outside of oncology. And if you notice in Shank's slide a couple of seconds ago, most of those indications were solid and he malignancies, not all the things happening outside of oncology, I would say until now. Uh, so we specialize in RNA cell therapy. Does this work? It does. Uh, we all now know what RNA therapy is, I hope, with uh, mRNA vaccines against COVID-19. It's a technology where you have a small piece of RNA, you encase it in a lipid nanoparticle, you expose the patient to it with a vaccine, with, a, with an injection, and it's a great way of delivering protein that you want to create immunity against because lipid nanoparticles are very immunogenic. It's not a very good way to do much else because not only are they immunogenic and they get cleared easily, they're very challenging to target towards a specific organ or tissue. That's one issue with RNA therapy. On the other side, we have cell therapy and the proto prototypical cell therapy now is CAR T cell therapy. The challenge with CAR T cell therapy is that it's DNA based. Uh, and because of that, uh, you'll see why DNA has its issues, insertional mutagenesis, lack of control of how much you want it expressed. Uh, we are combining RNA and cell therapy by using the cell as the carrier and RNA and not DNA as what's encoding the protein that you want expressed. Uh, 
and the protein that we are expressing in the product that I'll talk to you soon, uh, talk about soon is the uh, chimeric antigen receptor or CAR. Now I could spend half an hour just talking about this slide, but CARs are proteins that short circuit the mechanism of T cell activation. T cells are notoriously complex. They need, they don't just recognize any protein on the cell surface. That protein needs to be expressed as part of something called the MHC or HLA complex. Uh, they need a good stimulatory signal. There are a lot of inhibitory signals. They're really easy to inhibit. What CARs do is they short circuit that. So they, they can recognize with a CAR any protein that, that is expressed on the surface. They're not MHC restricted. They do not need a co-stimulatory molecule. And they are maybe less, less exposed to inhibition. And there are two ways that are used to put in that protein inside a T cell. One is DNA and the other is RNA. And DNA-based CAR therapy is what's conventional CAR therapy now. It's what works. And it's what's been approved. So there are six different CAR Ts that are approved to date. Uh, all of them are for heme malignancies. Four are targeting CD19, which is on the surface of B cells, and they target uh, uh, ALL and B cell lymphoma. Two are targeting BCMA, B cell maturation antigen that is on the surface of plasma cells, not B cells, and they target multiple myeloma. So it's, it has been successful. It's also been quite costly. So this is actually a paper that'll come in gem internal medicine. It's been in press for a few months now. I hope it'll happen this year. But a few colleagues of mine and myself looked at different therapeutic um, domains and therapeutic modalities and see what the median annual cost is in cancer only. And you can see that we all know that cancer therapy is expensive. CAR T cell therapy, which falls under gene and oncolytic virus therapy, is very expensive for many different reasons. This doesn't even include the cost of managing toxicities because you'll see in the next slide, it can be quite toxic and patients who get DNA-based CAR-Ts, conventional CAR-Ts, end up in the ICU. They need steroids, tocilizumabs, other medications. So the actual cost of conventional CAR-T therapy goes upwards of $2 million, not just 450. That's the, the list price. Uh, so this is why it's toxic. If, when conventional CAR-T therapy, you infuse a small number of T cells that have a DNA-based vector, usually a lentiviral vector. Uh, first of all, you need to give those patients lymphodepleting chemotherapy to, quote unquote, make space for these T cells, because you're counting on the cells to proliferate, to divide inside the body itself. And you need to create the right cytokine environment for the, the cells to proliferate. And to do that, you need to give chemo. So there's toxicity and cost of chemotherapy. And then, as the cell divides, the DNA vector divides alongside with it, and you can't really control that. So you infuse a small number, the cell divides, the DNA vector divides, and it's really exponential growth. So we all know now what exponential curve means. I mean, we all experienced it two years ago with a different kind of, of uh, replication, but this leads to many toxicities. Most of all, cytokine release syndrome, that's associated with very high fevers, low blood pressure, uh, hypoxia. Patients end up in the ICU because of that. And with neurotoxicity, where you can have anything from headache to seizures and, and severe debilitation and even Parkinson-like symptoms. And the two approved BCMA therapies, you can see what the rates of CRS and neurotoxicity are. They, they are quite high. And most of these patients end up getting treated for these, these symptoms in addition to having the cancer that they've been treated for. So what RNA does, if you use RNA instead of DNA, RNA is notoriously fragile. And a lot of work has been done to stabilize RNA. So you don't have an issue of persistence. You have an issue of fragility. You put in a higher number of cells. You proliferate the cells ex vivo outside of the patient. So you don't need lymphodepleting chemotherapy. You infuse a huge number, billions and billions of cells with the RNA that encodes the CAR protein. As the cells recognize the antigen, they divide. The RNA doesn't divide alongside with them. It gets diluted out and degraded on top of that. So really, what you infuse in the first place is what you get. And that leads to finer control of how much CAR you're expressing. So you can consider this therapy almost like a drug where you can calculate pharmacokinetics, you can do repeat dosing, and you can do outpatient infusions. And 
with this better theoretical safety profile, you can consider indications outside of oncology. Because with conventional CAR-Ts, not many diseases will uh, benefit from such a high-risk therapy. With RNA-based CAR-T therapy, you're expanding the, the field of indications to areas outside. And what Cartesian did first as an indication outside of oncology is myasthenia gravis. I bet most of you haven't heard of myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia means weak muscles. Gravi gravis means severe. It's severe muscle weakness. And up until we came up with some treatments 50, 60 years ago, a third of patients died from it. It's an autoimmune disease where the body creates antibodies against the neuromuscular junction, the connection between nerves and muscles. And patients first have weakness of the eye muscles, which are the ones that are usually the, the most active. Uh, so they have double vision. That progresses to difficulty swallowing, difficulty speaking, slurred speech. And it goes downward with difficulty moving, even difficulty breathing. The patients end up needing feeding tubes and end up needing a ventilator because they're, they're, they're so weak. And most of the treatment now is just broad immunosuppression. Those antibodies that are against the neuromuscular junction are due to the, this pathological interaction between autoreactive T cells and B cells that mature into plasma cells, and plasma cells create the antibodies. And the way for us to treat it now is just to give broad immunosuppression to cut all of it down with steroids, which have many side effects, least of all higher risk of infection. Uh, there are some new biologics now that all deal with the antibody and neuro neuromuscular junction part. None of them treat the actual plasma cell that secretes the antibody. Now, Descartes 8 is a T cell, autologous T cell, that has RNA that it codes a, B uh, a, a car that, that's targeting BCMA. So it's targeting plasma cells. It's, it's meant to clear plasma cells. We also think it indirectly affects the autoreactive T cells and activated B cells. It has a, a broader possibly function than, than just targeting plasma cells. But th th we, it's, it's a treatment that we tried in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, which was shown to be uh, safe. There was no cytokine release syndrome. There was no neurotoxicity. We had repeat dosing on an outpatient basis. And we tried it in, in myasthenia next. And we did it through this trial, MGO1, where first we tried three different dose levels in three patients. Each patient got escalating doses of Descartes 8, and there were no dose limiting toxicities, no CRS. In part two, which is just completed, we tried three different dosing regimens, given six doses either twice weekly or once weekly or once monthly. So six doses total, repeat infusions of, of CAR T cells, and you'll see the results of this in the next few slides. And now we, we were confident enough that there is something to the treatment that we're doing a placebo-controlled trial, which will be the first placebo-controlled con trial of any CAR-T therapy. So first of all, safety-wise, there has been no cytokine release syndrome, no neurotoxicity. All AEs were mild and self-limited. And it was all done on an outpatient basis. Uh, but more importantly, the activity. Now, myasthenia is sort of subjective. There really is no objective measure like a tumor measurement on a CT where you can see, oh, tum tumor shrunk. Uh, it relies on assessments of the neurologist by the patient and on patient's own self-report. So there are these four scores, QMG, MGComp, MGDL, QOL, that, that provide some, some uh, sense of how severe the myasthenia is. QMG and MGComp are objective measures or semi-objective measures. They are the neurologist testing muscle strength by using devices such as hand grip, by using a, a spirometer to measure the, the depth of breathing. Uh, and the bottom two, ADL and QL, are the patient's report of their own symptoms. The higher the score, the worse the patient is. A drop in, by two points in MGADL is considered clinically meaningful. A drop in three points in QMG and MG comp is considered clinically meaningful. And this is the data from the first eight patients who received six doses, either twice weekly or weekly, of Descartes 8. And you can see that treatment for these patients ended around week three for some, around week six for others. You can see deep responses, much deeper than what's considered clinically meaningful in all of these patients that lasted well after the treatment was done, which made us think that there is something to it. And if you look at recently approved therapies for myasthenia gravis, 
these decreases are threefold higher than the decreases we've seen in those therapies. And it's one thing to say, oh, MGDL score dropped by six points. What does that actually mean to the patient? Well, one of the patients on the trial will actually felt so well after treatment that, that he got in touch with MGFA, which is the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, and actually have a blog post that you can access now where he gives an interview about what this treatment meant to him. He's a forester who planned an early retirement because he has a physically demanding job that he couldn't perform, uh, had difficulty swallowing, had difficulty speaking. After treatment, all of that went away. So his scores now, if you look at them, they are like scores of anybody who's sitting in this room. And that's, it's been four months since he finished treatment, four months and counting, and it's, it's still like that. This is, this is a recent interview. So we're encouraged that there is something to this, and we'll test it further in a randomized phase 2B trial with, where 15 patients will get either placebo or Descartes 8. All the placebo patients will, add, will end up crossing over to Descartes 8. So nobody will get apheresis for nothing, but we think this is a big step in CAR-T treatment in general because there has been no randomized trial to date, definitely not placebo-controlled tri trial for any indication, and this will be the first indication outside of oncology. So uh, to summarize, conventional DNA-based CAR-T therapy is costly, complex. Uh, it restricts its use to cancer only. Uh, toxicity profile as well restricts its use to cancer only. RNA cell therapy, for the reasons I discussed, may expand the use and it has a much better safety profile. And myasthenia gravis might be the first indication outside of oncology where CAR T treatments will be effective. And most importantly for the gathering, all of this from discovery, lab, GMP manufacturing, Clinical operations and translational work has been done by 20 people in an office in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So it's, it's all been done here. So thank you. All right, great. <clears throat> well, no slides from me today, but I wanted to tell you a bit about uh, the company I work for, Regenex Bio. My name is Craig Malzahn. I'm the head of technical operations at Regenex Bio. Um, that entails uh, the manufacturing functions, process development, supply chain engineering. Um, and we've been keeping ourselves busy for the last uh, several years. The company was formed over 12 years ago now. It's a clinical stage company. Our lead program is in pivotal trials. We have extensive IP in adeno-associated viral vectors, so AAVs for gene therapy, that's our focus area. Our NAV, NAV technology, um, sub-licensed now to over a dozen companies developing gene therapies for patients. And I'd say most notably, Zolgensma for the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy uh, uses our NAV technology. So it's been a highly successful gene therapy now in the commercial market. It's making a major difference in kids with SMA um, and certainly been a huge financial uh, success. About six years ago, uh, Regenix Bio started developing uh, our own AAV drug development pipeline. So our therapeutic areas now that we cover, cover uh, retinal diseases, neuromuscular diseases, and neurodegenerative uh, diseases. We've treated to date over 500 patients with gene therapy now. So quite extensive experience uh, in the field and in clinical studies. You think about most gene therapy studies, they've really targeted rare, ultra rare diseases. Our lead program, RGX314, is for wet age related macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy, both large market indications. So a little bit different than what you might typically think of. Uh, this program is partnered now. We did the partnership deal with AbbVie uh, just last year um, for global commercialization of the program. And then last year, we also uh, moved into our new purpose-built uh, facility, new headquarters uh, here in Rockville. It includes now our research team, our process development teams, our GMP manufacturing facility, and of course, all the other corporate functions. 
The organization itself now are over 400 uh, employees, so we've grown tremendously over the last few years. If you think about AAV, it's still a newer field of medicine. It's going to take some time to establish with patients, physicians, payers, the healthcare community uh, in general that it's you know it's a safe and beneficial uh, type of type of therapy. When you think about conventional biologics, you know therapies like enzyme replacement therapy, treatment with monoclonal antibodies, other proteins. You know, these products have been obviously very, very successful, changing patient lives. They're safe, they're effective. A problem, though, is you know, these treatments, they create this paradigm of continuous long-term treatment. So administration of the product every month, every couple months, over many years, sometimes for a lifetime. And this creates a long-term and very expensive healthcare burden a burden on patients and often their families as their routines are disrupted every month, every couple months, to go to the clinic, to get their injection, to get their IV infusion. You know, patients get very anxious when it's time for their treatment, causes a lot of anxiety, and patient compliance is, is a real issue. You also think about rare diseases, really only about half of them today that have been identified um, you know, half of them don't have any, any effective uh, treatment available. So with gene therapy, you know, the idea is what if with a single one-time treatment, one-time administration, we could treat these patients' disease for five, ten years, maybe a lifetime. Patients with a defective gene, patients that cannot produce a vital protein to ward off their disease, patients that are losing their vision, losing their sight, or worse, kids that may not survive to the age of 10. You know, with gene therapy, that's our goal. With the innovation we've achieved, we're able to deliver in vivo a functional gene directly into patient cells. With AAV as that vehicle, it transports that functional gene into the cell and into the nucleus where it forms an iposomal DNA that codes for a protein that the patient is deficient in effectively making the patient's own cells you know, the micro factory for a protein or for an antibody. So this new innovative approach uh, really has an opportunity to establish a new paradigm for treating patients with a single injection. Thank you. So at this time, I would like to open it up for questions for our panelists. There is a microphone right down here in the front. So if you want to make your way up, we would love to take some questions. Yeah. Hi, uh, Tony Altar from Splice Therapeutics. A uh, question for you, Craig. Uh, very interesting progress at your company. I know that the neurological indications have put a uh, focus on brain delivery of AAV and that Regenex Bio has been doing quite a bit. Could you comment on where you are with uh, intravenous administration of AAV, getting that construct into the brain, and to what extent do you avoid uh, accessing for other tissues? Yeah, that's certainly not an area where I'm an expert in, but um, with those types of diseases, getting into the delivering gene therapy into the central nervous system, obviously critical. Uh, to be able to get it into that space that, um, you know, where, where we can actually treat the disease within, within the brain. So a few different techniques certainly for doing that. Uh, very key for us to partner with uh, organizations that develop delivery devices uh, for therapy, um, uh, ICV, IC, uh, types, of, types of treatments to, to get our gene therapy there where it needs to go. Thank you. Go ahead. First of all, thank you all for coming. Great panel discussion. I have a question. Uh, how often, oh, by the way, my name is Hemi Chopra, University of Maryland. I have a question for all three of you. Uh, how often do you work with academics to de get technologies or licensed technologies from these academics for your companies? So what I'm looking for is how often is there an academic collaboration with a company like yours, especially startups? Thank you. Cenk, I will let you go first. Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think 
through the 20 plus year history of our company, uh, we've always had ongoing academic collaborations. Our technology came out of academia originally. And we're searching for innovative partnerships always at a global level. So I think that's very key to our success and our, our path towards innovation is collaboration with academics. And some of our instruments are uh, often at academic centers. And the smaller labs can um, work on getting their process optimized and then take that into translation. We're really trying to um, uh, enable that, that path towards translation. It's a very long list. <laughs> But we'd be happy to discuss uh, collaboration with you. Yeah, please reach out. Yeah. So the the NTB CMA car that we're using came out of NIH. So there's definitely the collaboration there. Uh, we have not had that kind of a collaboration since. Every other product in the pipeline has been completely from from our own lab. But we're looking at interactions for that, and even more so for looking at mechanisms in translational work especially collaborating with institutions where the clinical trials are, are already being held. Yeah, and then for us, I mean, our company was founded out of uh, collaboration with the University of Penn, uh, with Jim Wilson's lab, um, where a lot of our uh, NAV technology originally generated. And we continue to work with academia today on various different projects, things like cell line development, um, others, you know, that are, that are related to the process development this space as well. Next question. Yeah, so access to care is you know, a continuing issue. So can you describe, any of you, for your particular companies, do you see the development of your technology uh, also going towards a day where somebody could get it you know, on a Native, Native American reservation or a community health center rather than having to go to a major center to get their treatment? Uh, Thank you for bringing that up. It's something that I neglected to mention. More than half of our sites are community centers that are community neurology clinics for myasthenia gravis and more community oncology clinics for our real real myeloma trials. So one of the benefits of RNA therapy is that you don't really need a BSC, you don't need a hood, you can mix it up in any bench top and the process we've developed internally is that anybody with no prior experience in cell therapy can administer it. And the safety profile of the therapy allows it to be administered in a community setting. Craig, do you want to go next? Sure, I'll go next on that one. Um, you know, depending on on the disease that we're talking about, I mean, there's certain certain disease conditions um, indicated earlier with delivery into the CNS, where that's clearly a surgical procedure where you need a specialized unit. Um, but then we also have the spectrum of, of our, our program for vision loss. We have a second generation uh, delivery device that is targeting the suprachoroidal space of the eye. In that setting, um, with that type of, of delivery vehicle, uh, you can deliver the product in an office setting. You don't need a surgical setting to deliver that gene therapy. I mean, maybe I'll make a few comments. I think that's a great question. And I think for these uh, innovative therapies to reach everyone, we need to uh, fix the paradigm and make sure that all uh, caregiver settings uh, are appropriately trained and enabled to be able to do this. I think part of it is decentralized manufacturing. So as we build up these technologies, we need to make sure that they're not just running in a very fancy $100 million facility, but it can be brought to the bedside. And we had worked with groups in the past, um, and we, had a, we made a significant investment in the past towards one day, uh, single day CAR T therapy, essentially by the bedside. I think there's still a lot of work to be done, but uh, it's a great question, and we're moving in that direction. Next question. Hello, I'm Shelley Pressler with the Zor Group, and I am so excited about all of the brilliant technology that you're all working on and bringing to the patient population. I'm from the Raleigh market and we're having a lot of workforce discussions on so many fronts. And I'm seeing a gap in different places. And I'm curious for each of you if you have noticed a single gap when you're trying to hire people, whether they're straight out of school or coming from somewhere else. Is there any specific process knowledge or GMP knowledge or anything that you find yourselves having to continually teach people that you wish they'd come to you with? 
That's a great one. Maybe I'll jump into that. Go ahead. The, the field really needs new recruits. I think it's uh, probably a lot easier to be a YouTube celebrity and doing some of the work that we do. So I think p part of it is selling science to the next generation that this is fun, exciting, it's fulfilling, you can impact the world. Um, I think GMP manufacturing experience is really important. And I worked in a previous life in a CDMO organization where we would hire from some of these organizations that gave that experience to students. They would come in into the clean room and, and come into high paying jobs, right, straight out of uh, these training programs. So I think we need more initiatives like that, and there's a, a lot of work in this area locally as well. So, yeah, uh, I'm probably the, the wrong person from the company to ask this excellent question. I can only echo what Chang said and say that clean room experience in GMP manufacturing is a big area of need, but it's also one of the benefit of being located in Maryland, where d there is a lot, a lot of there are a lot of human resources available there. Yeah, and I'll third the GMP uh, experience is great, but I will point out one area. I have two uh, teenage kids, and I've yet to convince them to go into automation engineering. <laughs> but um, if, you've, if you've got anybody out there that wants to get into that field, exceptionally hard to find uh, the still skill sets in that space to do what we want to do, because these processes are becoming, we want them to become more and more automated. Um, but finding the talent out there is it's hard to come by. Patrick, you're next. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm just going to expound upon the previous question. So what are you doing to drive the talent to the Maryland area? You mentioned, Cenk, that it's um, not only an emerging area of biotech, but it's an established one, fourth largest in the country, right? So what are you guys doing to drive talent here and then also develop it? Are, are you partnering with ins institutions or um, colleges, community colleges, things like that? I just moved to Maryland, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I can, maybe, maybe I can point out a, a couple things that we're doing. It's so, so important to us. Um, I think one area that's super critical is internships. We actually had 37 interns over the summer. So for a company of 400 to have 37 college students come in and start to learn our business and, and get their hands dirty. and. Uh, start to understand where, where they want to be in their careers. That's helping us develop uh, the pipeline of talent for people. There's no question. Um, there's some great programs around that, uh, you know, actually that, you know, we can, we can partner with to, to develop some um, certification types of programs, uh, development in the GMP manufacturing space, things of that nature that uh, we've worked with as well that, that can really help uh, develop that pipeline overall. So we have a similar employee to intern ratio because we have we had two interns at one point. <laughs> now it's only one, so it's 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 up there. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. One thing that has not been done that uh, we're looking into. There is experience in Europe, especially in Scandinavia, for graduate students to do some or all of, of their work in an industry lab. And we talked many times that our lab is really a great place to get experience. And, and why could it not be done here? So that, that, that's something we're looking into. Any other questions for the panelists? Go for it. Just a follow up um, to kind of all of your points. One thing we're looking at in North Carolina is young people don't know what they can do in our industry. And we're actually pushing down into the high schools and we're starting to think about, is there something high school students could do, almost like an internship? And now there are also more jobs coming up. I think that technical level degrees would be sufficient. Obviously not for your PhDs, that's completely different. But how do we let younger people know what the potential is? Because it's kind of unreal what we do in our industry and a lot of young people just don't know. So thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll, I can start there again. Um, we actually had some of those interns were actually high school students, so we started pretty early. We had some 16-year-olds uh, running around the facility. Um, I've also seen successful programs where, you know, maybe it's a su summer biotech club come in, tour the facility, spend the day with us, learn about the technology, the jobs, the roles, how, you know, STEM programs can apply what they're learning in the classroom. Uh, to, to the industry type of environment. And I think that starts to build some interest and intrigue around, around the field. I think that's helpful. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, NIH in the area yeah, has the, the summer program where they do have high school students rotating during summer. Such a thing could plausibly exist for the Maryland Biotechs where you could have a centralized application system and different, uh, different companies looking at applicants and picking them. So similar concept as to the one where, where NIH labs look at, look at summer school applicants and pick them out there. Again, we're a 20 people company, not much we can do on our own to do but we'll contribute as much as we can. All excellent points. I think we probably have time for two more questions. Hello, a great panel. Um, my name is Jeff Hung, CEO of Nalgene. So I just want to follow up on Greg's uh, excellent point and actually a plug for tomorrow's automation in biomanufacturing because as the uh, industry, I think truly to reduce the cost, it really relies a lot on the automation, which is much lacking right now. So I just want to put in the plug for tomorrow's panel I'm organizing tomorrow at night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Last question. And the most controversial one. <laughs> I can't wait to hear the, the responses I get from people. Boston and San Francisco area, the Silicon Valley, et cetera, consider the world's best, right? Everyone wants to go to Boston, everyone wants to go to the West Coast. So how is Maryland, and this question is for everyone, how is Maryland um, competing with these two areas? I know we have a great life science background, but I think the problem, in my view, is Boston has everything there. The VC is there, the companies are there, the talent is there. So as a community and as a state, how can we further improve ourselves as indeed the life science capital of the world? Does anyone want to take a stab at answering that controversy? <laughs> <laughs> I told you. <laughs> well, I think, I think one thing, you, you talk about those, you know, Boston, San Francisco area, having, having everything there. Uh, one huge advantage we have here already are, are the government entities, so NIH, FDA, you know, uh, NSAT. I mean, the, these organizations here really help stabilize the area. I think the other big advantage, cost of living is a little bit better here than in those places. So um, I'm not one. I, I grew up in this community, um, and, and I'm planning on staying here and not, not moving out. Great answer. <laughs> All right, I think I will say thank you to our panelists. So Craig, Milos, and Cenk, thank you so much. Thank you all for your attention. It was a pleasure being up there. Take care.